Let's give an update now on the latest on the coronavirus vaccines. There appear to be some issues around it. Pfizer has backed down over what was seen as a demand that our government put up sovereign assets, guaranteeing an indemnity against the cost of any future legal cases. And while the Health Product Regulatory Authority says the suspension on the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has been lifted, it seems that people are not being vaccinated. Professor Barry Schub is the co-chair of the National Vaccine Advisory Committee, the Ministerial Advisory Committee. He joins us now. Professor Schub, good evening. Are health workers being vaccinated again with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine at the moment? Uh, good evening, Stephen. My information is that it hasn't quite started yet. I believe it's about to start fairly soon. Certainly the regulatory authority, SAPRA, has recommended that the pause be lifted. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what the delay is, but uh, I believe that it should be starting probably any day now. And no delay would be coming from government. It's actually not their decision, is that right? It's the Ethics Boards and SAPRA. So in other words, it's the people in charge of the Sasanka study who basically have to get this going again. Yeah, I, I, to be quite honest, I'm not quite sure where the holdup is. As you say, SAPRA has uh, approved the lifting of the pause. Uh, it, as you say, it's not really the Department of Health. So uh, I'm not quite sure why there is this delay, uh, but my information is that it would be starting up very in, uh, in the day soon. Then the issues around the Pfizer vaccines, and I realize again this is around the health department, they do the negotiation, but there's a big issue around issues around liability. It's very complicated. Normally vaccines that we roll out have been tested over many years, and in fact the vaccines, the new vaccines that we roll out are for children, and usually they've been tested again and again. This is a slightly different case. This seems to be quite a complicated technical issue. It's led to some disputes in some cases, not in our country, but it is something that really does need to be resolved. Yeah, there's an issue called a no-fault no compensation fund, which the vaccine manufacturers are demanding that the governments, not only our government, I think all governments, uh, set up. And this is a fund that people who have a very, very rare, you know, these are very safe vaccines. But, you know, there are some very rare obviously more significant side effects. You know, a lot of people get very minor side effects that we're not talking about. We're talking about the more significant side effects, that there's an avenue for them to claim, to claim damages. And they would claim damages from the compensation fund. So this is part of the negotiations with the vaccine manufacturers to actually procure the vaccines that the government set up this no-fault compensation fund. Now, exactly what the technicalities of the holdup, and unfortunately I can't comment on. Um, but, I mean, you will know this. I mean, our vaccine history goes back, I think, 120, maybe even longer, 150 years. I can't think of any yeah. cases where someone would actually have needed money from a liability fund. Stephen, I think I recall many years ago there have been some claims. I can't even tell you whether they're successful, but certainly you've got nothing like the history, for example, in the United States. Uh, and I think what's what probably is behind this is that the vac uh, you know, vaccine man making a vaccine man of vaccines generally, there are relatively few vaccine manufacturers as compared to makers of medicines, for example. And I think part of the problem is that these claims or these litigation claims have been enormous, very high claims. And uh, in a way, it's just scared all vaccine uh, for uh, companies making vaccines. So I think this is the kind of legislation has been put into place to have funds available for claims against, uh, against vaccine manufacturers, which in a way protect them. And this is why it's a sort of an independent fund with a, with a kind of financial, uh, with this financial provision to, um, to satisfy these claims. At this stage, the second phase of the rollout of the COVID-19 yeah. vaccine, so for people who are not health workers, of course, that magic date, the 17th of May, will you recommend as a committee, as a co-chair of the committee yourself, that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine be a part of that? Oh, indeed. I would have absolutely no, I, would, I, I have not been vaccinated myself. I am a healthcare worker, but not, a, not facing patients. But I'm awaiting the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, to, be, uh, to get my SMS where to go and get it. So I, I would certainly have no kind of hesitation whatsoever. Um, and then, are you expecting any delays? Because there is huge urgency to this. I mean, we've seen a slight uptick in the number of COVID-19 cases in three provinces. Yeah. People are very worried about a third wave. Some people have got their first SMS. They're waiting for their second after registering. They want to know when and where they're going to get vaccinated. Uh, and obviously, people are 
I suppose the phrase is champing at the bit. We all want as much information as possible. Do you believe once the second wave starts, we'll actually be able to vaccinate large numbers of people quite quickly? I mean, I mean the third wave. Uh, you know, Stephen, that's a, I, I, you know, I unfortunately I just can't answer that. You know, we don't know when the third wave is going to uh, hit us. I think it's going to come with the cold weather. Whether the cold weather will be May or June or July, I think we'll have to really wait and see. Fortunately, it doesn't appear that the, uh, the worry about super spreading events being a trigger uh, over the festive season, that doesn't so far seem to have materialized. Hopefully, it won't materialize. Uh, and we can just hope that the third wave will be... I think our, our, our information, the third wave will probably not be as, as, uh, as severe as the second wave, which is largely driven by the variant. So that probably won't, probably, of course, this is really unknown territory. We're really kind of speculating on this. How many people will be vaccinated, particularly the high-risk people, before the third wave? You know, all I can say is we hope as many as possible, but uh, it's very difficult to kind of make predictions or precise predictions. Professor Barry Shub, thank you as always, co-chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee for COVID-19 vaccine.